the goal really is to, you know, we'll look at what Scruton has to say in his understanding of the human person, and then we'll do like a quick comparative, you know, like how does this, you know, distinct from uh, Augustine, you know, through Locke, through Parfit, and, and such. And then I thought it'd be good just to wrap up by talking a little bit about what does it matter, why is that important, and what are the implications. Um, so we'll get to that. Okay. So right off the bat, you know, it, it's a fair question to ask. Uh, in an empirical sense, what does that capture the human person? Um, what do you think, like, just off the cuff, like, what are some of the limitations of an empirical understanding of the human person? How, how might that be a reductionist view? Anybody? He kind of compared it to music, how, like, you can describe, like, all the notes in it and stuff, but, like, it doesn't actually tell you anything about the piece of music itself. Yeah, very good. You know, you anticipate that. So that's right. And, you know, what do you think, like, what, what would be other uh, analogies you think you can make? It could be art. I mean, I think art's an easy one to do that with. I was watching this, uh, well, let me put it this way. You know, if, first of all, you know, we can't go entirely black and white here. Maybe there are those people that reduce the human person purely down to the mechanistic views. Um, I guess you would have to hold that way if you were a strict empiricist. Uh, I think what happens on the other flip of the coin is that even if a person's not a strict empiricist, and you understand that you can't reduce the human person down to mechanisms in the same way that you could music because you obviously would lose something, right? If we're only going to talk about the volume and the tones and vibrations and everything and how it affects our particular nervous system and how the chemical releases and such, you know, so there might be a, a materialist reductionist that would admit that, but then they're going to make all these things quite subjective. In other words, what cannot be in tune or cannot be evaluated by the empirical methods really not going to amount to much more than your own subjective opinions. Um, you might have a good argument for it, but it's really what you think here. So, you know, some of the things that we're going to talk about here in the future is, you know, the idea of art and the subjectivity of art. Uh, like, for instance, let's just now, I'm just curious what you think about. If somebody were to tell you that uh, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, what would you say to that? I mean, you can agree or disagree and then what would you say? Beauty's in the eye of the beholder. What do you think? Because like everyone has their own idea of what's beautiful to them. Okay. Um, then what role would beauty play in that? Do you think? I mean, in other words, you know, what role would beauty play in the human person's life if it really was it's yours and yours and yours? What do you think about that? And do you think it's entirely true? When you depend. You could. You're right. Um, that would still be subjective, though, right? It's what you think is beautiful and such. Um, I mean, it's true that physically we're attracted to different people, right? That's sort of good, right? I mean, you wouldn't want that kind of uh, log jam where everybody's after the same look. But I don't know that it's that wild even in the secular culture, right? I mean, models, male or female, may have a certain look, and we find them attractive. If we didn't find them attractive, why would they use those models to try to sell anything? Now, we might say, yeah, but hasn't that image changed over the years? Well, it has, but it hasn't been drastic, right? I mean, we can look at how body shapes and sizes and such um, may be attractive to different cultures even, but within the Western idea, um, there's been a somewhat you know, steady view as to this is beautiful and that's not beautiful. Because here's what we're going to talk about another day. You know, when one of us says that's beautiful, can we be saying anything more than what we think? Um, MGM, you know, the... Um, the movie company, the Roaring Lion, right? Uh, we'll, again, we'll talk about this again. But the Latin logo that's above the Roaring Lion in English means art for art's sake. You know, there's no other purpose for art and such. Um, you know, we're trying, to, and, you know, what we're going to look at later, and I'm just talking about it now because this is going to affect, in other words, your understanding of the human person is going to affect how you view these things, right? So if we think, you know, that form follows function, and there's no real purpose to art besides that, beauty is only subjective to what you think or what you think, we're almost going to have to say then, well, 
maybe there's something to this empirical reduction of music, and anything outside of that, it's just a matter of taste. And of course, we all have different tastes, so we really can't say anything significant about that. All you can do is share with me what you like, and you can share with me what you like, and if we happen to like it together, we could say, yes, that's beautiful. Other than that, there's not much to say. Um, there's something else going here, because you know, we have to remember that we're part of the same culture. So if we look at beauty like that, you know, what would be our view of the human person and the particular qualities that that individual has? Do we just evaluate those qualities by what we subjectively think is good or subjectively have taste for? And how would that then affect the dignity of another person? In other words, if there's not something inherently in the individual that they deserve dignity for the very fact that they're human beings, or can we project some sort of, you know, taste or, you know, some sort of subjective evaluation of that individual? I mean, isn't that where most of our problems in the world have come from? That we haven't recognized the dignity of the person across from us, you know, and we might say yes, but that's not the same as art, and I'm, I'm saying I understand that, but we also have to pretend that these two things are not connected in the way that we think, right? I mean, what we're trying to get at in this latter part of the course is, you know, a phrase that we use all the time, I know. How many times have you and I said, I know? And we never realized that implicit in those two th words are arguments. There's an I, what is that I? What is the self that you're saying? I, I know it sounds silly off the top of our heads, but remember, even with Hume, it kind of sounded silly maybe in the, in the original proposition that we don't know the cause and the effect. We only know exactly what perhaps follows. You know, we could say, well, with probability, it's going to happen. But remember with the bread and all the flavors and the smells and everything else, the fact that that's connected to the nutrition of the bread, if we can replace that in some sort of replicator and the bread had no nutritional value, how long would it be before we conditioned ourselves to no longer think that bread provides us nutrition? That was Hume's point, that all we know are these causal relations and we don't really know why. Um, if we start to think in terms of that with you know, um, mechanistic views of the world, um, then beauty can never have anything objective. Um, and there's something else that's at play here. So I guess that was his point. D you know, do you want to break everything down to where it's nothing more than assimilation of all these various things. Now, truth be told, you know, we have to watch and be very careful with the term uh, mechanistic because it doesn't always just mean that we're identifying the parts individually from each other. It could very well be, and it probably does mean in, very, in a lot of different ways that we're looking at the whole. Um, but think of what fields you might be going into. Again, medicine, it's quite easy to do it. Anything in a care field, it's quite easy to do it. Um, you're trying, you know, you're always going to be caring for a person. It's something in medical ethics you try to drive into people's heads. But that's a person there. That's a human. That's not just a patient that you're not treating a pathology, you're treating a person. Okay, well, but that begs something too. And then what does, what does personhood mean? I mean, what am I treating? Am I treating a bundle of impressions? Am I treating just a collection of memories? I mean, what is it that I'm treating here? Um, we may not be conscious of all of these things in our mind. None of us are. Even if it's my field, I don't walk around conscious of this all the time. But nonetheless, we have to understand that this subliminally you know, fosters uh, an impression of um, the other individuals. And it gets easier to talk about if we can come to some sort of you know, consensus, per se. Um, let me see. He also talked about Daniel Dennett, right? And the levels of intentions and systems. Um, let me see. And what else did he talk about Dennett with? Oh, well, he even talked about in paintings, right? I mean, you could probably get a computer. In other words, how about this? You have a sculptor put together something, and then you have some sort of 3D printer, printer you know, replicate it. Do we have the same thing in both of those? Um, are we just replicating somebody else's idea, and where did this idea come from? Um, anyway, I guess there's a lot here that we could talk about. Um, now, Scruton said, the reality is, is that the minute that you're in a conversation with somebody, and the minute that somebody, you know, responds, I, or I do this, you know, he goes, there's a certain authority that gets attached to that, and there's a recognition that you're talking to another self across from you. Oh, by the way, did anybody watch Outer Limits? I know it's probably on the upper channels, you know, today, but it was through the 90s. Um, there was, there was a... a there was a show on yesterday that actually had about a replicated body and how you would relate to this replicated body. It's almost like I wish I could have watched the whole thing and if I do this course again at some point, I think I'm going to integrate it in. Okay, well anyway, that was a side note. 
Um, anybody ever hear of the, the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber? No? Uh, Martin Buber had written this book, I and Thou. And what Scruton's trying to get at here a little bit is that, you know, conversations reveal something about us. And not like that gets revealed as information in the conversation, but the fact that you're in a conversation with somebody. The fact that you can address yourself as an I, and that person recognizes you as an I. As soon as they recognize you as an I, they're granting you a certain level of authority. He's going to try to make the case that you cannot be in a relation, you cannot be an I in a, in a how do you want to say it, in a relationship, outside of a relationship. That's probably the clearest way to say it. In other words, we're only an I in relationship to somebody else. So there's a certain amount of authority that we present ourselves, and then that we say, I'm this, and there's also a certain amount of dignity the other person recognizes in us. Um, which brings something into the mix that some of the others didn't, maybe one of the others brought up, is that, is that part of a human nature, relationality. Um, we might start talking about our inclinations, the search for truth, relationality, um, the desire for something good, right? People are always trying to do some good, even if it's a perceived good. Are these things accidental to what the human person is, or are these essential? Um, all right. So anyway, his point here, basically, that the other is essential. In other words, there's no way that you could ever disconnect the I from the other. Um, it's part of our nature. But he begins his understanding is in the nature of the human person. And that's a bold claim in today's landscape to declare that somebody has a nature. In other words, that particular nature is going to be the same regardless of what culture you happen to be in, regardless if we go back 2,000 years, or regardless if we go 2,000 years in the future. We recognize there's going to be some things that change, and not everything is that consistent or that steady, so we call those things accidental, but is there an absolute nature? And then how would this... Think of what we're going through with like immigration today, you know, and if anybody's concerned about xenophobia... You know, if somebody says that we have to have respect for these people who are trying to find asylum here, the question, it begs the question, why? <laughs> why? I mean, you know, everybody just presupposes, well, because they're human. What does that mean? Now, I know we can't get into these arguments in some, you know, especially in social media, probably not even on the news and such, but there must be something there. And the minute that you say there's something there, it further begs the question, well, what is it? In other words, it ha is it just a web of sympathy? Are they, they're shaped like us. So therefore, you know, it could, could it be, we might have that same sympathy for an android. We might have the same sympathy for some sort of, um, you know, AI that's been placed in a particular, uh, some robotic system. What's the difference between a human and those things? If there's something essential to a human, and we say that person has a particular dignity, then what's that base thing? Um, you know, civil law struggles with all this stuff, right? Um, even if anybody goes into any sort of ethics or if you're going in any field where you might be talking about animal rights, you're going to have to deal with this too. To what degree do they have animal rights? Well, they, they're self-aware. To what degree are they self-aware? Is that what you're talking about then? Is the human person a person if they are aware of themselves? And you say yes. Well, then what happens when we're not aware of ourselves? You know, I think even uh, Scruton talked about one of the challenges with people with extreme autism is that they can't recognize the other individual. And, you know, and it's obviously a, a defect that's, you know, biologically and, you know, chemically based in them. But could you imagine, though, I mean, okay, not even equating the two, obviously, a person who might have sociopathic tendencies would have that same issue, but in a different way. They wouldn't recognize the other person as any relation to them. They're outside of them. It's not another me. So there is no I, thou. So think of how many things in our particular culture are predicated on us recognizing another individual as another us. But, there's, but that flows off the tongue so easily. And unless you have a way to back that up and say, well, what do you mean? First of all, you said another us, so that you must believe that there's an I. And if that's another I, then what is this I? Who, so let's go back to I know. Who is that particular person? We usually skate over these things because we don't, we're not extremely self-reflective or if we are self-reflective, we don't quite know where to go. Where do I go for this information? And once I do find the information, how do I know that I'm on to something, right? Um, a way to do it is, you know, you can almost look at your worldview and say, what's necessary? What human person, what type of human person is necessary for this worldview? And then if you say this and that, what implications would that have? That's why we're going to look at it at the end. Because these all have implications. Wherever a person falls on this, right? Anyway. 
Okay, so remember Augustine, everything was about God and man. He, he couldn't even envision that a person could talk about this I or this self without a God. Um, as a matter of fact, he thought that not only would he learn something about God by knowing him, but he, by knowing himself, he would also know something about God because he believed that the human person was made in this image. Um, so everything for him was inner reflective, right? He didn't, you, you should see a very stark difference between Augustine and the ones that followed. There were no elaborate, um, you know, proofs that he had to kind of, you know, bring up and be clever with. Um, no thought experiments necessary. It's me and my God. Um, remember, he also said that in the same way, you know, that light comes from the flame, so too then, you know, that's the relationship between the soul and the body, right? Your soul and even, let's say, even the intellect can be inflamed by that, not to reuse the word and such. So you couldn't imagine these two that are ever separate, okay? Um, that was one view. Now, what I, what I would have done if this were like a longer course, because I know it probably sounds odd, but you can, you can easily take a course just on this. I actually have a graduate degree just in this. I mean, the whole graduate degree is, you know, um, philosophical anthropology. How do we understand the human person from a philosophical point of view? It, I was going to bring in a couple of books just for demonstrative purposes to show you just in short spans of time how much writing there is trying to figure the human person with, you know, just maybe in the medieval period or um, in the romantic period of the late, you know, 19th century and such. You know, when people are trying to drive down and say, what is this? Um, because it really forms the basis of our laws, our relationships. There's hardly anything outside of our world. This is, I mean, in other words, I think on a certain level, this could be, once you've come to a conclusion on it, the most practical thing that you do, because you become very principled. And the idea about forming principles of the human person is then we're not all over the board. Um, so it's kind of like we once we've determined this, we then apply it, and then we have to take you know, our lumps, and we take the good, how, wherever it falls, that kind of thing. So that was Augustine. You know, then if you remember John Locke, John Locke placed everything in the consciousness of the human person. That was what we call the self. And the self really was the memory. So he kind of conflated the word consciousness and memories. And the, the transitivity of it was that, you know, if we knew how we were the same person over the years, well, because if A was like B and B was like C, then the theory holds that A must be like C, or let's bring it back, C must be like A. So that was his theory, and this was the beginning of modern personal identity. Um, part of what I, you know, I see in this, the way that I was presenting it here, is we're starting to conflate, and some people do, uh, personal identity with human personhood. That, you know, some of these things, I think, as we talked about before, weren't exactly essential uh, to the human person, but nonetheless, they still became advent um, to what the human person could become. Um, but nonetheless, any questions on Augustine or Locke? And then I'd be interested at the end what you think. I mean, so start thinking about like which of these have an appeal or what your issues are with them and what you actually think the human person is. And you could be uncertain. That's quite all right. You can have a good idea, but you're not quite sure what all the implications are. That's quite all right, too. Okay, so um, Bernard Williams, if you remember, was interested in, you know, how do these um, memories, past and future, um, indicate who that we are, and remember he had the thought experiment of torture. So if you had, you know, memory A going into body B, or then of course the other one would be reversed to body A, and you had to pick who's going to get tortured in the future, you would probably pick the body where you think that your memories and consciousness is going to go into. So he's trying to make the point that there's some connection there. Um, so, you know, we have to start asking then, and you know, I think he did too, that yes, our memories past are obviously part of ourself and the present, of course, but you know somehow these will then contribute to the future too. So we start to ask questions like that. But he thought to strictly ask questions like that was almost egotistical, right? I mean, most of these guys were either tied into bioethics or just ethics generally. They were trying to figure out, you know, how does this apply? Um, and there's a lot of people that we didn't get to a lot. And then Derek Parfit, remember, he had that almost Buddhist-like understanding of the no-self. So all of the features that we would call human, all the characteristics, you name them, if you could abstract them, in a better word to understand it, if you could peel them away, 
And if you just keep peeling away all the variety of these things, you're left with nothing. It's a no self. So that is all it is. So it's almost like a bundle of all these things. So in the future, we're not worried if, like, if we could take your consciousness and put it into a future body, and then we'd say, do you survive? That's not the question he asked. He actually said, that's almost egotistical. Don't worry about that, more or less. So rather than the transitivity you know, of, say, Locke, where A is B, B is C, and then therefore C is A, he's saying, look, some of B is A, some of C is B, therefore some of A is still in C, and he's okay with that, right? Um, that's his view of personal identity. And then finally, Marriott Schechtman, remember she said it's really where we place the emphasis, or she, I'm sorry, she thought that the people that had come before her either placed too much emphasis on memories that we were uh, unconscious of, like not thinking that those were important, or they overemphasized memories that we're conscious of. So remember I gave you stories of, well, the one I did from everybody loves Raymond. He had no idea why he touched food to his chin. Well, that might have been an important you know, aspect of his identity, but he was totally unconscious of where that came from. Um, and then other times, you know, there's many memories that you and I have um, that we don't think about in our normal day. So how much really does it affect our personal identity? So she said what's really important is these narratives that we create. So as we create these things, it's almost like we put together our story and then we identify with that. Um, so these are at least the ones that we went over. I think... It, you know, it's a little bit thick on like the Locke, Williams, and Parfit, and these guys are a little closer. That's why I wanted, I switched things around and wanted to bring in Scruton at the end because you'll see in him almost a harkening back to Augustine. He's starting to talk, there's got to be some nature there. And if you, there's other, there's plenty of videos that he puts out, actual videos, where he'll talk about the nature of beauty and other things and how those things affect all of our, um, our understandings. So, what do you think about any of those? <coughs> I know we're getting close. Everybody going home tomorrow? Are you? Yeah. Are we skipping classes tomorrow? Yeah. Now you can tell me. I don't care. <laughs> right? Um, okay. Now, here's the thing. Scruton makes the point that most of our interactions are based on the understanding of freedom. In other words... Someday you're going to fall in love and maybe get married. And the whole experience is going to be predicated on the, that the person freely chose you. Um, somebody might say, what about an arranged marriage? Well, you know, even, even those are somewhat you know, chosen, right? Um, I mean, unless it's an absolute forced thing. My grandparents were, were arranged marriages. and I had a friend um, from India. Him and his wife were an arranged marriage. And he's only my age, right? Um, I remember telling him, I said, but, you know, don't find me, you know, Starkey, but your wife's beautiful. And he says, yeah, but it wouldn't matter, and he said, you know. But in my grandparents' case, you know, that wasn't the case, this, this new idea that you fall in love and get married, it wasn't <coughs> part of the idea. And if you read even, like, studies, like I do a lot with human sexuality, there's, like, an underlying joke that um, us choosing our own mates, we're not doing as well <laughs> as the parents choosing them, you know. Maybe our young selves just aren't figuring what's best for us, but that's other stories. But if everything's a biological inheritance, how do we hold anybody responsible for something? I mean, every time that we're in conversation with somebody, hey, I'll see you later, and I'll meet you, whatever, I'm going to go out to eat here. You know, everything about our relationships is predicated on the fact that they're all freely chosen. Um, even in our legal system, you know, people do things that they, you know, go against cultural norms. We can argue all day about where we've developed these norms for, from, but the reality is, is that how do we call somebody bad or you know, guilty? To what degree? Did they really have control? I mean, we try to mitigate that in our you know, system, don't we? I mean, to a certain extent, like even in, like in you know, flat out homicide, you know, we think, well, if it was a crime of passion, that's not as you know, intentional as somebody who premeditated, so there has to be some sentencing considerations for those individuals. So you see right away, we know that there's an issue to that. But what if we really said that, you know, this bio... And, and let's, let's, let's forget if you have all free will. Let's realize that how many times it, it matters in our lives where you were born, your region, the country you're from, the socioeconomic status. And we all have, we're not all equal. I mean, we're all equal in dignity, right? We're not all equal even in biological inheritance. 
Uh, they talk about, um, and I know this is a little more psychology, but they talk about birth order. You know, um, and of course it depends on some other things about the spacing between the births, but uh, intelligence and IQ basically go with the first child. If there's, you know, short years, like two to three years between the first and the second. And they're figuring it has a lot to do with the tensions that the parents are giving the child, that they can't give a second one. Um, now, if there's a farther space there, it may not matter. Um, who has control over that? And they've even done twin studies. That twins typically are you know, a few IQ points lower than some other peers because they think of the shared um, the tensions that they have to give. Um, and how about IQ? There's, not, there's only so much you can do. You know, If you have an IQ of 100, you're average. If you have an IQ of 120, you're doing good. The IQ of 80, what, what, did you choose that? I mean, so there's a lot in biological inheritance. Health, if you're struggling with health things. All of these things, you know, um, you know, do mitigate our ability to say that we are in control of our futures. I mean, it's, I always thought it was a little odd. It's, it's some inspirational thing to say when you're young, you could be anything you want. But we all know that's not true. I mean, you don't have that kind of options. They're very limited. Um, even, in fact, I was talking with a, a professor here today, and I was saying how when I was, uh, you know, I think I told you, my father never graduated high school. I, there was no counselors that helped me try to get into college. I knew nothing. I was young for my age. You know, my, I was young for my age. I you like that one. I was young for my grade, right? So I remember being on the phone. I think I was 16. I'm on the phone with uh, Union College. They wanted to offer me a full scholarship. I didn't know where it was. And I said, where, where are you? And he goes, Union College. I said, I don't know where that is. And he says, Schenectady. I said, I still know what that is. He goes, in New York. Now, I knew Manhattan. I said, like, in the city? No, no. And I'm like, oh, my dad's over there. Who is it? I mean, I said, it's a college. What do they want? What, okay, what exactly? They're offering me a scholarship. I mean, could you imagine that conversation? I look back, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, could somebody have slapped me in the back of the head? But who would have known, right? I mean, so what a different situation would have been if my parents were professionals. And, or even this, right? I mean, if you went to, a, like, a private, like, I know if you went to a Catholic high school, you had P PSATs, right? And I also know that you probably had SAT courses. And if your family had the means, you may have even had um, some, what do they call it, tutoring on the side. Well, how does that compare to somebody who's never going to have that experience, right? That doesn't make anybody feel guilty. You shouldn't feel guilty about it. But I'm saying those are the things that are totally out of our control, you know, so when we even talk about determinant or free, we could talk about um, biological determinism. You know, our, I mean, it'd be very difficult for me to understand that somebody would break us literally down to our mechanisms, you know. Um, but even if we were to try to do that, um, we don't really have the free will. As a matter of fact, I got you two quotes here, right? Christopher Hitchens, who has now passed, says, yes, I have free will, I have no choice. His point was is that outside of some theistic notion, he says, I don't know how you can make a sound argument for free will. He said, but my God, could you imagine living your life thinking that you have no choices? He says, that's, that's you know, it's terrible. So just, just act like you do. He goes, act like you do. Which I always thought was an odd argument for an atheist because then you might as well say, well, then who cares if God exists? Just act like he does. But uh, that never came up. Um, Smolansky is a philosopher who believes that free will is an illusion, but along the same lines. You're better off just to accept it. Now, I guess part of what Scruton was talking about, he wasn't mocking neuroscience, okay? He's just saying, let's make certain that that doesn't tell us everything. Don't start to fall into that trap is what he's saying. You look at an MRI, you're looking at an algorithm put onto a particular film. You're not looking at pictures. You know, they have done some sensory information and they have managed to put this into something that we can digest by looking at images. But you're not looking at that thing thinking. I mean, we can really kind of make a misinterpretation of what we're seeing. Um, I was listening to a podcast coming here this morning. It was a TED Talk, actually. Uh, and it was, I'm thinking it was a neuroscience, but he was talking about how all of reality for us is nothing more than a controlling illusion. Um, I'm sorry, a controlled hallucination, okay? Now, what he was trying to get at was he started out, and you had to give him a second to build his point, all right? Now, I found issues with it, but I still thought, again, not half bad. He started talking about how, you know, when he was, AMD, he was under um, 
if I guess total amnesia, oh my God, anesthesia, and talked about that dreamlike state when he came out. And he said, now, if you would have forced him at the moment that he was, you know, conscious to say, how long were you out? Not a clue. He said, I think at that point, you know, he didn't say this, but I'm imagining if you could change, you know, the structures of the environment and tell the person they were out for 20 years, you could probably gaslight them. You know, you guys know what gaslighting is? Do you? Good. Oh, did you? Did you know it came from a really great movie? You gotta go watch the movie. It's, that's where it came from. The term came from a movie, Gaslighting, where the husband was trying to convince his wife that she was nuts by um, turning the gas. In other words, it wasn't on, it was off, this and that. You left it on, and you got to the point where she didn't know what was reality anymore. So the term came from that. So anyway. Um, but could you imagine, though, if you put somebody underneath um, anesthesia and then woke them up and changed the environment and it made it look like some future thing? And everybody played along. How long do you think you can mess with them? Now, if you guys are thinking of doing this, you're cruel. Could you imagine? Do- <laughs> Carlos, you weren't thinking that way. Right? Oh, I have a brother at home I could do this to. You know, so his point was this, though, is that what our memory actually is or what our perception really is is an assimilation that our brain makes on previous experiences. And that's the only way that we know things sensory. This is his, his, his idea or his, his plan on it. So the reason why we see optical illusions. Um, now, usually when somebody talks about Rene Descartes, and I probably did it, you put up a, an optical illusion and say, see, your senses deceive you, and everybody goes, yeah, but we know it's an optical illusion. But his point was this. Um, so he had like almost like picture like a checkerboard, black and white squares, and um, then he has, uh, obviously all the squares, all the white squares look the same. They're gray, whatever they might have been. But then he puts like a post, like a, like a fictional... Uh, three-dimensional rod, and one of the squares looks a different color. And he covers it, and you can see it's the same exact color. He uncovers it and looks a different color. And he says, your brain has experienced in the past that an object like that will cast a shadow. So it obviously is interpreting. In other words, our brain never really sees reality. It always interprets reality. And his point is, is that the reality that we all call real is nothing more than an agreed-upon hallucination that we've all accepted. Now, it's an interesting thing to talk like that, right? But I'm thinking, what would Augustine say to him? I wonder what some of these people would say. They're like, You're, there's a certain reductionism going on in there. Remember, Augustine didn't have to really rely on the senses so much. Um, Augustine was like, no, the inner self is where I'll find this. So what is the I, right? Um, these all have repercussions, though, right? So whatever, wherever you fall above on this, that's not a scale. Wherever you fall on the scale of understanding the human personhood <laughs> and personal identity, it's going to have implications for how you view the world, not just in reality, but also in how you view a person's freedom to act within it. And the minute that you're going to see that there's some sort of, you know, implication for a person not acting free, you're going to think differently. I mean... You know that if you got into a fight with your sibling or something when you were young and they came back to apologize, you're like, yeah, mom made you. It meant something. I mean, you have to admit, it meant something that they would have came there on their own, that they weren't forced into that situation. So there's something, but, the, but you know, um, I guess Scruton would even point out just the fact that you're in conversation, you're affirming that person as an I, and you, you display a certain amount of authority on that individual. Um, so there's a lot here that you can probably play around with, but um, I'll bring up the other one, and then again, I just want to see if you guys have anything to say about this stuff. This is the, the other part. Remember, uh, I think it was with Hume, we are starting to ask about, no, was it? No, not with natural kinds. Um, no, it wasn't. Uh, my mind blank right now. But when we use the term human, when we use the term person, is it a real thing? Is it a natural kind? Or is it a total construct? Is it a term like lithium that we may argue is what it is, and if we change something there, it's no longer lithium? Well, what then? What would be something like, like just think out loud. What would be something that if you took away from a human person that you think would make them not human? What do you think? And you don't have to worry about being consistent, and I don't care. Well, like that, like somebody who's dying. Okay. 
if you can live, you know, eternally. That'd be something. You'd have to question that. Which is int- I have something to say about that. I don't want to get off topic. What? Uh, like if you take away like any mistakes, like errors. All right. So almost like a computer-like perfection, right? Um, emotion. Yeah. How about that? There's almost a Star Trek thing, right? Anybody watch Star Trek with data? You know, data. I guess they called him on the show. He he wasn't programmed to experience emotion. Um, how would that be? I mean, how, what would you say like about psychopaths? I like that. Well, you know, like, we have to start, even? we'd have to start, if you wanted, like my own personal thing, we'd have to start talking about um, deficiencies and potency and act. In other words, there could be something there that's just not realized. In other words, yeah. um, it'd be the same way as saying, like, okay, like if, you're gonna, if you're literally going to hold to um, memory, if you were a very strict memory is personal identity, then a person that was in a coma would pretty much lose their personhood. Um, you would probably even say that for somebody who's asleep, although you'd make the argument that it's a temporary situation. But while they're sleeping, you have to question, you know, an almost person to be something transitory and such. Um, what else? Because these, see, you're coming up with things that are probably essential. Now, they're pretty safe ones, okay? I would think that, you know, there's something about perfection that's not within the human person, and we're certainly um, are mortal beings. But what else? I mean, in other words, your list of human qualities has to go beyond perfection and mortality and such. Um, what else? What about freedom? Do you think that's essential? I feel like it's essential to at least like have the belief that you have freedom. Yeah. Okay. It's safe, but it's also not a half-bad response, right? That would be a Daniel Dennett response, just... You know, live as you though you do. Although, you know, I think on some level you'd have to admit that if you were conscious of it on a regular basis, it'd have to have an effect on relationships. You know, in other words, people that, you know, got into a top tier law school, you couldn't even say good job. <laughs> you know, what would you say? Um, I guess if we had all the criteria. In other words, the only reason why we can't make sensible predictions about a person's future is because we don't have all the available criteria. If we had all the available criteria, we can lay your life out in front of you. You can kind of talk about an existential crisis, right? I mean, that's almost like, then what's, what's the purpose? Which brought me back to this. Um, I know I asked you guys about Star Trek before, but there was a, um, a character that would show up called Q. Anybody know anything about that? All right. Um, it was short for the continue, well, Part of the, he was in the part of the continuum. They were these absolute beings. And he would show up on Star Trek, and this was Next Generation. He'd show up every so often just to kind of like tantalize and such. But at one point it was revealed that one reason why he was so antagonistic to the humans is because he said you cannot imagine the absolute boredom of eternity with absolute power and perfection. I mean, there's nothing there. It's like you have the absolute power to do everything. Everything you do is perfect, and there's nothing that can hurt you, and you'll, you're an eternal being. Talk about sad. The picture of Dorian Gray. Did anybody read that? You did? Good for you. Um, the story was about you know, a man who sold his soul, almost like a, dog, like a Faustus type situation, to retain his, um, his, his youth and beauty. So he never grows old. The portrait instead of him. The portrait grows old. Now, that's great until the person that you're deeply in love with is growing old and then dies. And then you're burying children. I mean, every parent knows that's the biggest fear that you will out that you know your ch- you will outlive your children. And it's like it's like it's not meant to be that way. There's something there. Could you imagine having that? So I think that's a good thing, mortality. I mean, people have played with that. But did you have your hand up for something else? Yeah, but I, just, I, I kind of forgot about it. <laughs> Sorry. I, I shoveled that one down. Um, so, you know, we have to then ask, you know, what, if we're going to tie, okay, do you think it's essential for us to always have a human who's a person? Or can we have non-person humans? What do you think of that? Because that'd be something you're going to have to tackle with depending on what, you know, principles that you follow. In other words, do we assign personhood based on certain criteria? Or 
is the fact that you are a human being. In other words, you know, there's usually like three terms that get banded about pretty quickly. You know, human, there we'd even have a little bit of a problem if we're going to talk about being a natural kind. Um, we'd have to say, well, maybe we don't know exactly where the, you know, the Neanderthal and the Homo sapien, we don't know exactly where that was. So even if we're a little unclear on that, we know, and today they're wondering if there really was a distinction, right? Um, but the reality is, is that we're going to say that the human is, a, is an absolute, you know, species separate from other entities. Now, we can at least say that we are so from orangutan, chimpanzee, and all those other things, even if we share a ton of DNA. I've already said in the past, we can share 99% of DNA with an orangutan or a chimpanzee, but that 1% must be extraordinary because it accounts for all of civilization. Um, so let's just take for granted that we're a human. But even a being, like a being, we're going to leave it at this. That's a whole course in itself, too. An ontology is the issue. Let's just say the being is that a thing is. So we have this thing. It is real. It's, it's actual. And it's human. Well, then what do we do then? A human being might be one thing that we can say we all are. But then, is every human being a person? What do you think of that? Talk about an ethical issue. Is every human being a person? Anybody want to take a stab at it? They all die, but is that okay? But is that going to be your quality then? Like you know, in other words, you're a you're a person if you can die. It's okay if it is. I'm just curious. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I would like view someone that's like is maybe morbid, like if they're like someone's like brain dead in the hospital. I would say like that's a human, not like a person, because they're like not there anymore. Okay. Now, you, that's not an unfamiliar scenario. So. When you say they're not there anymore, see how we're originally, now we're on, originally, we're automatically doing selfie with particular. So what is not there? Like, who's they like that are not there? The person themselves. So, like, I guess similar to, like, the memories and, like, who they are, like, in their mind. Like, like if they can't function like they were before anything. Like, if it's so it's just like, like self-consciousness. Yeah, if it's just, like, a body, then that's just, like, a human. But, like, a person has, like their personality, their memories, their like selfhood. Okay, but then that's then we're gonna have to ask the question what do we do with a one month old? You know what I mean? Yeah. Now I'm not saying that that defeats your argument. I'm just curious like what would you say about that? Because you know anybody that talks about like issues of like the of ethical issues of life, I'm talking all the way from abortion to euthanasia, any of those things, uh, um, uh, Live organ donation. I mean, we, I can come up with all the scenarios. You have to have some understanding of the person that's going to fit at both ends, or a reason why you're changing. You can say, "Well, no, I believe it here, but it changes there." You can say that too. Can you not tackle the argument of the one month old by saying that, like, the person who's in a, like a coma has less potential to live than a one month old in terms of self awareness? So they're like, less of a person. Sorry? So are you saying they're less of a person, or? No, 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 like, okay, so, like, there's, like, you argued that it was consciousness, and then you said, like, oh, what about a month, one month old? But in discerning a person who's in a cognitive state versus a one month old, one has less, um, like, potential to continue living versus a one month old, who, like, in a few months, he'll know who he okay, is. Okay, no, I think I understand it. What I'm, what I'm trying to get at is if she said that that person's no so longer he, like, there. You could you could count the one month old as a person, right, uh, because he has the likely possibility, uh, the highly possibility of becoming I, a person I when he's it. conscious versus someone who's in a comative state where likely they're not going to ever, ever wake up. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Or like if they're I, just living off like, like a ventilator. So there, there's some idea <laughs> that, you know, so future aspects then come into it. Yeah. I guess to some degree. Yeah. I guess somebody would have to play around with like uh, what, how much future aspects, how much percentages and such, you know. Um, I mean, I'm not, I'm thinking out loud. Like if I were in a conversation with somebody about this, those are the things I have to start chopping at. Well, what do you, where do you exactly does this, like should we then, what if the person, uh, okay, how about like um, a Terry Schiavo? Are you familiar with that particular case? Terry Schiavo um, was on a feeding tube, and, um, but other than that, we're breathing on our own, but no consciousness. 
and like that for a long time. And her husband one took her off of life, off of the feeding tube. Her parents tried to keep her on, but lost the battle because you know, I mean, most in, in civil cases, the closest relative gets that particular choice. But they were concerned with his motives because he was already seeing somebody else. Um, but so she was basically starved to death. Um, now, I don't think they had any brain activity they can necessarily measure, but the person um, wasn't able to swallow, but able to breathe, and she was able to process nutrition on her own. Um, but you would, but they were there for a long time. Now we have to. That probably would not defeat anything you just said. We have to almost bring an, an incident in, and I don't like the thought experiments, but I'm thinking of real life scenarios where somebody who was in a coma and not expected to live, but then did. We almost have to say that they regain personhood. What would you think about that? And I'm not playing gotcha, I'm just asking questions. Yeah, it's possible. Okay. Yeah. I would kind of say that, like, that would be a scientific anomaly. You know, if, like, yeah, it is an anomaly. There's no so, like, doubt. If we're trying to do something that's kind of general, then that would be like it's impossible to do something that'll be 100 percent certain. So if we're trying to get to that 99.9, .9, then there's always that 0.1 chance where like the dude will survive. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, okay. So this is an Augustinian Institute. So even in a Catholic bioethics mode, a full brain death, you know, they consider that to not be, you know, re it's a reverse, nothing's going to come out of that. And it's probably an anomaly, but they would never do that. But there's a lot of cases that probably are not so certain in between um, that, you know, but nonetheless, all we're trying to do here is develop the principle. Like, what would it constitute? Also, there's, like, also protocols that you have to give, like, at least a few weeks before yeah. turning it off, like, to be very sure that it's not going to be And, like, there's sometimes um, false regressions where like, patients have they're in coma and they wake up and they're great for like a week and then they go back. And yeah. Now I no, you're right. Now I guess though, you know, the only thing I'm trying to drive at here is at that point we're almost determining that the person's tied to the consciousness. And you're gonna have to, like you're making the argument that even though maybe a one month old doesn't have consciousness, they at least have future potential. Um, or higher potential. Or higher potential. I guess the only the only fissure in some of that is who determines these things. You know what I mean? That, that gets part of the problem. But the bottom line is this. I mean, you can spend a lot of time debating all the stuff that people do. And I, I do also because it comes up in a lot of issues. Um, but the reality is, is if it all seemed like it was a little bit of an academic exercise, in the end, it has a lot to do with our relationality, our understanding of free will and agency, our understanding of who this human person is and where the dignity comes from. Um, from a social justice standpoint, if you stick with a human person, a human being is always a person, then, you, and except for extreme cases, you know, you can make pretty good cases for everything from immigration to euthanasia, you know, but anyway, 